Good morning. It's good to see all of your faces. And for those of you who we can't see their faces, it's good to know you're out there with us in spirit, worshiping with us. This is the day the Lord has made. Let's rejoice and be glad in it. Will you please stand and sing along with us, My Lighthouse. my wrestling in my doubts in my failures you won't walk out your great love will lead me through you are the peace in my troubled sea oh you are the peace in my troubled sea in the, the silence, silence you won't, won't let go, go. in the question your truth will hold your great love will lead me through you are the peace in my troubled sea oh you are the peace in my troubled sea my lighthouse my lighthouse shining in the darkness I will find promise you will carry me safe to shore safe to shore safe to shore safe to shore shore. I won't fear what tomorrow brings with each morning I'll rise and sing Morning. A couple of announcements. Um, first, starting this week, we are hosting a Christian homeschool co-op. Um, the leadership team has approved them to use our space. It's uh, uh, elementary school through, I, I believe, uh, middle school kids that will be coming here and learning Christ-based, um, getting their education that way. So be praying for, for that group. Um, it's, a, it's an amazing group to have on our campus. And our preschool will be starting soon as well. And we, we just have such a heart for 
education in this area, especially kids to, to be educated and learn how to read through uh, the Bible, um, through the stories of, of Christ and the things that he's done. So it's really exciting to, to get to serve the community in, an, in another way like that. But be praying for those groups as they're here. It's, it's a, a difficult time to educate. So be praying for our schools, our educators, and our kids. Um, I know we have kids going to college for the first time. It's a really weird in time, space in time to, to be a freshman. And so be praying for those that are traveling and, and away from home for the first time and, and having to figure out how to make friends in a, in a weird environment. We have a couple of birthdays this week. Bill Just, happy birthday on Tuesday. Mike Levy and Dan Smith all have birthdays. And if I'm correct, all of those have been a deacon or an elder at one point in their lives. So it's, it's pretty amazing to, uh, to celebrate y'all. Um, if you will, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you in the midst of this past week that we just had. We can put everything aside and worship you because you are good. Lord, we pray for all the, the kids going back to school, whether it's to college or to high school or middle school or, or the first time kindergartner, God. I, I just pray that you bless the teachers, bless the administration, bless the kids and the parents. Um, give them wisdom on how to do this, God. I protect them. Lord, do great things through them. Lord, we're thankful that we get the opportunity to, to open our doors to a group of kids that will get to continue their education, learning more and more about you. I pray that you completely bless them for that. And bless the parents that are leading that as well. And Lord, this morning we, we pour our hearts out to you. We cry out to you because you listen. You're not a God that just wound this place up to, to let it run on its own, but you're a God that intervenes, that cares, God, and we thank you for that. We worship you for that. In the, in the middle of the storm or in the middle of when times are extremely well, God, you are always there for us, and we thank you for that. We give, we give you glory for that. It's your name we pray. Amen. Can I make it our Bible st- ladies' Bible study? We just finished up our um, book, So Long in Security, and we're about to move to our next study. We're going to be doing Priscilla Shire's Gideon, um, and that's going to start September 1st. So if you're interested in joining us, we meet on Tuesday nights on Zoom. So you can contact Dawn um, at mff.church um, for more information for on that. So. Now we will continue uh, praise and worship and song. Will you please stand? There's no space that his love can reach. There's no place where we can find peace. There's no end to amazing play. So take me with your arms spread wide. Take me like an orphan child. Never let go, never leave my
space that his love can't reach there's no place where we can't find peace there's no end to amazing grace sing i am i am holding on to you i am holding on to you in the middle of
to thee how great thou art how great thou art then sings my soul my savior god to thee how great thou Good morning again. I love it that you have chosen to come and worship with us, knowing that people all over the world are worshiping in really unique ways right now, glorifying God for who He is. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Jonah, chapter 3, the book of Jonah, surrounded by books that we don't know too well. So if you don't know where it is, look on that first page in your Bible. Jonah, chapter 3. We're going to continue our series in the book of Jonah, and we're, we're about halfway through right now. And we're at the halfway point. Things are about to take a turn. You see, the first half of the book, Jonah is called by God as a prophet. We know this in other books of the Bible that Jonah was a prophet, and he faithfully served the Lord. And when, when God gave him word, he delivered it. But he's given a word from God to go and to preach repentance to the Assyrians. And the Assyrians were, were Israel's bitter enemies. So Jonah runs. He runs the exact opposite way of where God calls him to go. And the theme of the first two chapters that in the midst of Jonah running from God, it was about God's radical pursuit after Jonah. He sent a storm. He sent a giant fish. And he saved Jonah. And last week we ended with Jonah's prayer. That in the belly of the fish, he said, salvation belongs to the Lord. You see, that's kind of the theme of the first two chapters, that salvation belongs to the Lord. No matter where we run, no matter how far we go, that salvation belongs to the Lord. You see that after all that Jonah has gone through, as far as he's, he's run from God, God continued to chase him. Even after he was vomited up by a well on the beach, we see again God speak to Jonah. And his, his calling to Jonah is the second half of the book. In the second half of the book, we're going to see things like God's pa passion for the lost, God's heart for the lost that don't know Him. We'll see God's passion to use us who are broken. Read through the Old Testament, read through the New Testament and find a person that God uses that's not broken. You'll see how you and I are called to love our enemy. And we're going to see that power comes when we, when we faithfully love our enemy. We'll see that God uses that in powerful and mighty ways. This morning, let's look at Jonah chapter 3, verses 1 through 3. We're only going to cover three verses this morning. Jonah 3, 1 through 3. It says, Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah for a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim, <clears throat> proclaim to it the message I give you. Look at verse 3. Jonah obeyed. He obeyed the word of the Lord and he went to Nineveh. Now Nineveh was a very large city. In fact, it was the, the capital of the Assyrians. And it took three days to go through it. You see, God's calling on Jonah's life the second time is almost the exact word-for-word -word calling that he gave to Jonah the first time. A couple of minor differences. Jonah chapter 1, verse 1 through 2, we get his first calling from the Lord. And, and look at it compared to the calling he just gave him. He said, the word of the Lord came to Jonah. 
to go to the city, great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me. So Jonah is first called. He runs over 2,000 miles in the wrong direction. God chases after him and he saves him. And you see God kind of say, all right, let's try this again. Even though Jonah had been through a lot, even though he had rejected God's call, and even though he had confessed, confessed salvation belongs to the Lord in the belly of the well, God's word did not change. God's calling on his life did not change. What's the only difference that you see there? Is Jonah's response. See, Jonah's response the first time was, feet don't fail me now, I'm out of here. His response the second time is he goes exactly where God calls him to. In verse 3, it said, Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord, and he went to Nineveh. Finally, the hero of the story, the one that, that God first called on Jonah's life. You see that first calling was to repair Jonah's heart, I believe. So I believe what happens to us when God calls us to do anything challenging. God sends us, not because He needs us, but to put a change in us. I was a youth minister here in this church for, I believe, 14 years. As Melanie said, my birthday's this week. I turned 40 years old this week, and it's, it's gone like that. I remember accepting Christ as my Lord and Savior in that pew right there. And being baptized in this church and, and being a youth pastor for 14 years, time has flown by. One of my favorite things that I've done in this church is gone on mission trips. Most of our mission trips, we went to Mexico. And God used us to do some amazing things to the people in Mexico. We saw salvations. We saw healings. We, we helped build churches. We did vacation Bible schools with kids. And the area we went to had no electricity, no running water, had to drive down a dirt road for hours and hours. So we had middle school and high school students that had been in this Lake Travis bubble their whole life. They got to step outside into a different culture, into a different environment, into a different way of life. They got to sleep under the stars. We slept in cots outside, and the stars out there were beautiful. There was no light pollution, so you could clearly see the Milky Way, and it seemed like more stars than you've ever seen before. But they also got to see how the rest of the world lives. They also got to experience what happens when God uses them, despite cultural differences, despite language differences. They got to see what it's like to live a week without a smartphone. We didn't quite have smartphones back then, but phones they had. Without schedules, without McDonald's. It was life-changing for many of them. And this week as I worked on this uh, passage, I, I got a phone call from, from one of the youth that has grown up now. That went with us several years to Mexico. Said it was the most significant life-changing event he's ever had in his life. To experience something that he didn't know that even existed. To be used by God in a way that he didn't know he could be used. He said those trips were the most life-changing things that I've ever experienced. The impact that God made on those that were there were great. The impact that, that we saw for the, the people in Mexico, the, the life-changing decisions they made, it was absolutely awesome. But the impact on the kids and the adults that went on the mission trip was mind-blowing to me. And many of the kids had never taken Christianity too seriously until after that trip, and, and it's like that was their root. It, it kind of grounded them. That's what missions do. That's why the book of Jonah does not start in Jonah chapter 3. You see, we could start this whole story in Jonah chapter 3 about God's calling, but, but we have Jonah chapter 1 and 2 with, with Jonah running from God and God pursuing him about his rebellion and about God's steadfast love and pursuit. And when he gets to Jonah, when he finally gets to Jonah, he scolds him, doesn't he? No, it just it reminds him of his calling again. It was like, Jonah, you got all that running out of your system? Let's go. It's amazing, the first two chapters could have been left out. 
The reason God does not start with Jonah's obedience is because God wanted the the first half of the book to show that that Jonah's resistance and God's pursuit and God continued to use Jonah despite Jonah being Jonah. One thing that seems universal to me is that if you are a believer long enough, you have either felt or are feeling now that I have done too much, I've messed up too much for God, one, to care about me, or for two, God, to use me to do anything amazing. Why would he use a screw-up like me? Have you ever thought that? I guess it's just me. (laughs) I know many that reject God's calling are at times the most religious, have the most biblical knowledge. If we read through the story of Jonah, who was the most rebellious in the story of Jonah? Jonah. The amazing prophet Jonah. Who knew God better than anybody? Jonah. Everyone in this story is more obedient to God than Jonah. God calls a storm, and the storm obeys. Sailors obey, they accept God. A fish obeys and swallows him whole and spits him out on the beach. Spoiler alert, as soon as Jonah preaches to his enemies... The ones that have rejected God their whole lives, not only rejected Him, but but mocked God, they accept and believe. Jonah, out of all of them, knew God the best. He was a prophet. He was the one in in this story that rejected God's calling more than anybody else. Reminding us that sometimes the biggest offenders of the mission of God can be believers themselves. God gives us a mission to go to the lost. Does he give that mission to missionaries? He gives that mission to all of us. We are all called to reflect the love of God. We are all called to reflect the characteristics of God in our own life. To go and to be the hands and the feet of Jesus. He has given us each the, the mission to reflect grace and truth. And those two things are really difficult to, to reflect. Usually we choose one or the other. We, we can do a great job reflecting grace without without truth or reflecting truth without grace. See, I believe the church is much more than a place to come and sing and to read your Bibles and to try your best throughout the week to not sin. You are made to reflect Him to a world that is craving that, to a world that desperately needs to see that reflection. Yes, we should sing together. We should pray together. We should study the Word of God together. But then we have to go and be the light of the world. Jesus didn't say, missionaries, go and be the light of the world. In fact, if you have your Bibles, turn to Matthew 5, Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter 5, we'll look at verse 14 and 15. In fact, let's start in 13. We can't miss 13 here. Matthew chapter 5, verse 13. So Jesus preaching says, you, and who's he talking to? Believers, he's talking to those that came to listen to him. He doesn't say, you missionaries, you deacons, you preachers. He says, you, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and to be trampled underfoot. If he ended there, that would be disastrous. But did Jonah become salty again? Verse 14, you are the light of the world. A town built on the hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand. And it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that that, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. You. You are the light of the world. And this world is desperate for light. Not because of everything that we're going on now. This world has always been dark. Since the fall, this world has always had corruption. It's always had darkness. I feel like every generation feels like their generation is the worst. How can things get worse? But, but read biblical history. Go back and read the Old Testament. There were some pretty horrific things going on. There has always been darkness since sin entered. This world has always needed brothers and sisters in Christ to be the light of the world. 
So let's come to church, let's sing, let's read our Bibles, let's listen to, to the sermons, and then leave these doors and be the salt and the light of this earth. You're the salt and the light of the earth. Being the salt of the earth means you preserve what is good and live as an ambassador. That's who you are. Now, when you are an ambassador of Christ, when you hear that, that you are to reflect Christ, is that overwhelming to you? Do you feel like an ambassador today? Do you feel like I, I give myself an A plus for being an ambassador of Christ? Most of us don't feel that way. We don't feel equipped to be an, ambas an ambassador of Christ because we know us. We know the skeletons that are in our closet. And that is part of being an ambassador of Christ. Of saying, when I am weak, he is strong. When I don't have this figured out, when I am struggling, I lean on him. Because he's my provider. He's my righteousness. I have no righteousness alone by myself. But when Christ is in me, I have his righteousness. And one thing we have to reflect over and over and over again is his grace is sufficient for me. When things are going well, when things are not going well, His grace is sufficient for me. We don't have to put on a mask. We don't have to be shiny, happy people. We have to reflect what's actually going on in our lives. And when you need to reflect God's grace, He will give you the grace to do that. 2 Corinthians 5 tells us what an ambassador looks like. 2 Corinthians 5, I'm going to read verse 17 through 21. Let these words speak to you this morning. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, is that you? Therefore, if anyone is Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone. The new is here. All this is from God, who reconciled us to, to himself through Christ and gave us, who is he, I'm sorry, and gave us, who is he talking about here? Who is who is Jesus, or who is, is Paul talking about here? He's talking about us. The ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world. Let that set in. God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ. Not counting people's sins against them. And he committed to us the message of reconciliation. We therefore are Christ's ambassadors. As though God were making us, making his appeal through us. How amazing is that? That God reaches a lost world through us. That we are the ambassadors of Christ. That we are His voice. We implore you, on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made Him who, knew, who had no sin to be sin for us. So that in Him, we might become the righteousness of God. Do you feel like you are the righteousness of God? I rarely, if ever, do. But this scripture says that, that his righteousness is in me. He took on my sin and replaced that with his righteousness. That's who I am. That's how I have to start seeing myself. And that's how you believers have to see yourself. That you have the righteousness of God. Our righteousness has nothing to do with, with us. It was bought with a price. It's through Him we're righteous. And if that's true, if He did redeem us, if He did forgive us, we are completely forgiven. Forgiven in a way that we've never experienced before. Even when we fail, even when we go down the wrong path, you see His pursuit for us and He says, you are redeemed. Are there consequences? Absolutely. There's always consequences from a loving Father when we go off course but it doesn't affect us being redeemed. There's always reconciliation, and we see that in the life of Jonah. And we're called to mirror that. And part of mirroring that is not acting like we've got it all together. It's saying that my righteousness comes through Him. We're called to mirror that to our coworkers, to our bosses, to that jerk neighbor next door. And I'm not talking about my neighbors because I know two of them are watching right now. I have, I have great neighbors, but some of us have neighbors that, that we just don't get along with. And, and God calls us to reflect that to people that we don't feel like reflecting that to. Call to mirror that to those that, that think you're an idiot. 
to those that think that it's, our beliefs are immoral, to those that don't vote like you, or those that don't think like you, or that, that don't have the same background that you do, God calls you to reflect Him, to be an ambassador. And not because of our superiority, but because of His greatness. And that's your calling. It's not just your calling, it's who you are. So why do we shy away from this? Do you find that calling easy and natural in your life? Some people do. Most people don't. Why is that? It's so much easier to come to church, to sing, to to listen to the preacher, to go home and to get ready for work, wash, rinse, and repeat over and over and over. It's comfort. When God calls you to go, to get out of your comfort zone, to be His light to a world, we fearfully uh, uh, struggle with that calling. We start shining a light on all of our shortcomings. God, clearly you're not calling me because I've done this and I've done that and, and I'm just not the right person. God, you got, you got me wrong. <laughs> we know that God calls us to go to the corrupt, to the unreached, to the less fortunate. And instead of shining light on your shortcomings, I want to encourage you to see yourself as God sees you. Every time that we're on mission, we are reminded of how much stuff we have that we don't need. I remember coming back from Mexico. While we were there, people were always, we, there was no, nothing close to cell phone service there. People started saying uh, Monday and Tuesday, it's kind of nice to not have our cell phone. It's kind of nice not having a, a screen to look, like, look at. But as soon as we get in the vans, what happens? You start checking, are we in service yet? Are we in service yet? What calls did I miss? And the conviction sets in. And something I think Jonah struggled with in his calling the first time is that that many of the people in in the church, I'm talking about the universal truth church struggles with, is that we have this, this, I don't know how better to put this, this sense of a a spiritual savings account. I've accepted him. I've been pretty good. I don't do this and I I don't do that. And I do this pretty well. I I can pass on this calling because I've earned enough credit. Jonah was a faithful prophet. Everything that we've read about Jonah up to this point was was how faithful of a prophet he was. And God called him. And he relied, I believe, on his past spiritual successes and said, I'm going to take a pass on this one, God. I love talking to people that come to visit the church and are looking for a new church. You know what the best question you can be asked as a pastor And you say, what are you looking for as a church? And they say, where can I serve? I'm looking for a church that I can dive into and find a place that that I can use gifts and talents that God has given me and where to serve. Past obedience gains no interest. But on the the opposite side of that, so, so past obedience gains no interest to when He's calling you. There's no past. But on the opposite side of that, past sins... Don't curse us. When He calls us, when we feel equipped and when we feel ill-equipped, it doesn't matter. The calling is what's important. He knows what He's doing. God gives us our daily bread. When we feel like it doesn't make sense and when we feel like it does, God gives us our daily bread. He will give you what you need. And you will do mind-boggling things when you stay the course. This church in particular, we pride ourselves on being a missional church. It's a cornerstone here. And God has done some amazing things here. I, I know because I've been here, like I said, since I was eight years old. But what that does not mean is that we can become comfortable. We have to keep taking the gospel to those that have never heard it before. To seek to be a church that makes our community and our city better. To see our neighbors, our friends, and our co-workers, and and the less fortunate, and the marginalized, the oppressed. To see them through the eyes of God, and to find ways to serve them and love them in a way that Christ would himself. It's what we strive to be. And as believers in Christ, we can never become stagnant in that. We can never become too comfortable that that God keeps calling to change ourselves and to, to change the world. And God calls Jonah and he changed him before he actually went to Nineveh. 
And I'm convinced that when we are all called, we are all called to be the salt and the light, to be His ambassadors. Not all of us are called to be overseas, to go overseas. Not all of us are called to preach. Not all of us are called to teach. But all of us are called to individually reflect the love, the mercy, and the grace of Christ. To have the mentality that, that my goal and where I live and how I organize my calendar and what my hobbies are and, and what, how I view my workplace and where I go and hang out in the city, our goal is to intentionally structure our life to reflect the love and the grace and the mercy of Christ. To find opportunities to serve. Serve people that are far from God. This week when you eat lunch... Is there somebody you can invite to lunch? Is there a phone call that you can make this week to somebody that you know is struggling, for somebody that that doesn't know him? Is there a way that you can communicate to lean towards discomfort? We as a church have to embrace this. Church goes from church, I believe, to brothers and sisters in Christ when we're fighting the same fight and when we all become missional. We have a saying in this church that every member is a missionary that have their own mission field. For some, it's, it's a stay-at-home mom that, that, that has their mission field with their kids. For some, it's in a grocery store. For some, it's in their workplaces. For some, it's, it's wherever you go. For some students, it's their, it's their university. It's their, it's their classrooms. Missions always revive the church. And it always will. Historically, missions always revive the church, not just those that the church um, is on mission with. It was Jonah's mission to go and to preach to his enemies. And that's going to be the theme throughout here. We're going to see that, that God called Jonah in particular to, to be his hands and his feet to those that hated him. We're going to focus more on uh, how to respond to our enemies in chapter 4. But missions change us. It shines light on our weaknesses a lot of times. And you might be sitting here thinking, you know what, I believe in all this. I believe that God calls us to be salt and light, but I, it's just not me. It's just not who I am. I'm not comfortable with going up and, and telling somebody about Jesus. There are some that, if you're honest, you, you want to care, but you just don't care about the problems of the world. You want to live in your bubble. You know you should care, but deep down in your heart... You know that you've never been torn up for other people. See that in Jonah before he repents. He does not have a heart for the people of Nineveh at all. They're his enemy. But it's in the belly of the well that all that changes. We are passionate people. Everybody has passions in their life that they can talk about forever. If somebody comes up to me and talks about college football, we're off, we're ready to go, and it can be hours later, we're still talking about college football. My wife has learned to never bring up sports to me ever again because I know she doesn't really care about it, and if she starts, she asks the question, it's just going to go on. Can't help it. People are passionate about exercise. Clearly, I'm not one of them. My CrossFitters know who I'm talking about. I have learned to never ask a CrossFitter about their workout because it'll be an hour into the conversation and I have zoned out five minutes in. How about people's diets that changed your life? They can go on and on about it's, a, it's an all-plant diet, it's, a, it's an all-meat diet, it's a Mediterranean diet, it's a cleanse, and let me tell you everything about it. For some, it's art. For some, it's movies, music, gaming. We are passionate people. And I truly believe that when we understand the depths of our sins and the depths of His grace and mercy and love and the necessity for others to accept Christ as their Lord and Savior, God gives us a passion. When we truly understand what God did in and through us, it gives us a passion to want others to have the same thing. God, help me see people the way that you see them. Give me a passion for the lost around me. Pray for that daily. That was our encouragement last week. I want to end with this. Many of you have a passion for the lost. A passion for the oppressed. 
Many in here have genuinely been changed by the gospel of Jesus. You know God. Even in difficult seasons when it just feels like you're having to get by, you know Him. But still, you know in your heart of hearts, you want to be on missions, but you've never been bold enough. Never taken that risk. Never gotten out of your comfort zone because it's just not who you are. It's easy to feel like a used car salesman. Feel like you're you're not wise enough. You don't know your Bible enough. You don't feel equipped. And in the end, we chalk it up to being uncomfortable. You have fooled yourself into thinking, I will do more harm than good. Have you ever thought that? I have. And you find comfort in that lie. Comfort in, I will... Support others who who are good at doing this, but myself, it's just not me. What are we talking about being good at? Intentionally loving, being patient, being kind, being faithful, being understanding, showing mercy to people the way that Jesus has shown you. We're not talking about getting on a soapbox. We're not talking about arguing somebody in the kingdom of God. We're talking about loving them the way that Christ has loved you, forgiving them the way that Christ has loved you, forgiven you. And that is who we are as Christians. It's not something we continually work on. It's something that as we get closer to Him, it is who we are, and we start to reflect that. And then we get to let Him know why we're doing it. Oh, that's a beautiful question. When you have poured time and effort into somebody, when you have loved them the way that that Christ has, and they come to a point, they just say, I don't understand why you're doing what you're doing. You can say, it's not me, it's Christ in me. You don't have to have the mentality that we've got to save the world. But be faithful to one person. That was the encouragement last week. Think of one person in your life that may not know him. One neighbor, one coworker, one teacher, one student, and be bold. I encourage you to stop putting it off. Put yourself in a community of people, even if it's a time where we're not allowed to put ourselves in a community of people. Find creative ways to reach people. Because it's so easy to hear this message and say, this cannot apply during a pandemic, right? People need love and forgiveness and the mercy of Jesus Christ during this time. And we are here to encourage you to keep on keeping on. Because listen, obedience to God will always be complicated. That can can be something you write down. Obedience to God is always complicated. I can't think of a time in my life where obedience to God came natural. It, it, It was easy. It's always complicated. Families, young professionals, stay at home parents. Single parents, single students, kids, obedience to God will always be complicated. How complicated was it for Jonah? He was called to go and to tell his enemy that God knew what they were doing. Knowing that he would at best be persecuted and at worst probably be murdered. The church can't be the church without you being bold for the sake of the gospel. The church can't be the church without you reflecting the love that Christ has had for you. That's why we say here that every member is a missionary. We all have a part in the body of Christ. And we need you to reflect that you are an adopted child of God. To hold block parties whenever we're able to do that again. To, to love your neighbor, to serve overseas, to reach out to your coworker, to, to go out of your way to, to meet and to know your neighbors. To invite people into your home again and again and say, this is a safe place if you ever need anything. We are here for you. If you have done that, you know the cost of that is always more than you signed up for. It's always messier than you thought it would be. And it can make you jaded but he's faithful and just. I want to encourage you to stay in the fight. Remain a faithful and steadfast servant as God is always with you. The end of the theme of the first chapter 
And the second chapter was salvation belongs to the Lord. Here's my encouragement. It is not our job to bring salvation to anybody. God uses us, but salvation belongs to the Lord. There is no failure when you feel like you're unsuccessful. Because the success lies in you following after your calling. There's no reason in counting. There's no reason in saying, you know what, I tried it with this person, nothing ever happened, so clearly I was in the wrong. Clearly I did something wrong. Salvation belongs to the Lord. But our goal and our our responsibility as brothers and sisters in Christ is to follow the calling, regardless of what comes out of it. We never know what happens in a person's life. We don't understand God's timing. You might just be the seed that that person needed for for 10 years later to, to change their lives. But when God calls you, He doesn't call you to see results. He calls you to follow after Him. The results are up to Him. Salvation belongs to the Lord, and we can have confidence in our calling. And never worry about the results because the results are Him. Because when we worry about results, you think, well, that didn't work. I better stop. Salvation belongs to the Lord, but His calling, His calling, that's yours. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank You that As your children, you call us to not sit on the sidelines. You call us to share our testimony of how the gospel, the good news of Jesus has impacted our life. God, that we once were lost and now we're found, and not that we have it all figured out, but you do. And we have faith in that. God, I pray that we reflect that when we don't understand what's going on and when we do. God, I pray we reflect that when things are easy and when things could not be more difficult. Help us to rely on you. God, use us to further your kingdom. And we'll give you the glory for it. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Let's sing again the first verse and chorus of I Am. Will you please stand and sing along with us? It's our departing prayer there's no space that his love can put there's no place where we can find peace there's no end to amazing grace so take me with your arms spread wide take me 